Okay, thanks for the introduction and also thanks to both previous speakers uh, for actually introducing many notions I, I needed in my talk. I should say that I find myself in kind of a difficult position because it was more an introductory talk by Hugo and then really advanced by Denis. So maybe the kind of uh, viewpoint you could uh, adapt on this talk is just to understand in, de I mean in reasonable detail uh, why the life is so nice for the Eisen model and how the, the structures uh, which uh, Denis was talking about, how they can be used to prove probabilistic theorems, something, something like that. Okay, so I should say that this part, everything but uh, the very last line, is something okay, I and my colleagues we uh, told about many times. Okay, we'll see how it goes. Here is maybe something, something new, time permits, and I'm going to, to say something new. Uh, okay, so just to have a picture in mind. First, please change the notation back. I apologize for that. Uh, I'm working with the Eisen model and spins are now again live on faces. Yeah, that's, s s sorry for that, that's not very classical, yeah, um, shame on me. But okay, spins on faces. And um, it's going to be always behind, it's going to be a question of universality. So, okay, for a while you might think about the Eisen model on Z2. So basically, I take a planar graph, a finite planar graph, which I'm going to notate omega delta. Um, okay, I took it uniformly at random, it happened to be a piece of Z2. <laughs> So just think about Z2. I'm going to think about the critical model in the most part of the talk. So in the, on the square lattice, uh, the critical value, okay, so let me first define the model. So, okay, we saw it already several times. What is that? This is a random assignment of pluses and minuses yet again to faces of my graph. So basically here spins life, leave. And the probability to see concrete configuration is proportional to uh, exponential, what I never know the sign, uh, to beat uh, some overall. Okay, I need some notation for faces. Typically, faces are going to be denoted by letter u. So u and u prim. And here is going to be some interaction constant. Think of it as a given positive number. Say for a homogeneous model, uh, okay, all these all these uh, interaction constants they may might be taken as one, okay, some interaction constant, and uh, then <coughs> what? Okay, this is a random assignment of of spins to <coughs> to the faces of my finite graph, and I am going following. Go assume that everything at the boundary is plus work with plus boundary conditions. This can be relaxed, for instance, you can uh, play with combinations of plus and free boundary arcs. Okay, but le let it be plus. <coughs> also, well, I need some other notation. <coughs> you can rewrite it like that. And this is pretty much, pretty much actually what we already did. So you can say this is some other normalizing constant, <coughs> but then to compute uh, the relative probability to see this particular configuration, you simply multiply overall edges. You multiply either once or some non-trivial parameter x. Okay, uh, effectively x is simply exponential minus 2 beta. Okay, that's my parameterization, and this is the link with the Owen model. You go basically already explained this morning. Um, okay, so now coming back to the criticality, <coughs> uh, it was mentioned that on the hexagonal grid, the critical value of the parameter is one over square root over three. On the square grid, okay, criticality. On Z2, homogeneous model X is 1 over square root plus 1, <coughs> square root 2 plus 1. On the hexagonal grid, faces of the hexagonal grid, X is 1 over square root of 3. 
Okay, by the way, this is tangent of by over 8, and this is tangent of by over n. But you can also have in mind uh, some more general picture. So, <coughs> okay, first, of course, it could be triangular lattice. Then, if you know what rhombic lattices and isogradial graphs, Z invariant model on isogradial graphs is, okay, just this picture. But actually, <coughs> one of the goals is to understand really the universal behavior of this model. So, you might think of the following, of the following setup. Uh, you just say, start, I'm going to erase it and don't comment much on that. Uh, you start with Z2, but instead of considering the homogeneous model when all the interaction constants are the same, you fix some fundamental domain, put here x1, x2, x3, x4, 5, 6, 7, or maybe even 8, 9, 10, and then uh, multiply it periodically in, in, all, in both directions. Uh, then it's known what is the criticality condition, again, due to <coughs> Hugo and David Simazoni and Zongyan Liels in this setup. Uh, so you might wonder, okay, how to see, say, conformal invariance in this setup. Then when you start thinking, you immediately uh, get the following question. Okay, but if they are unbalanced, then there is no hope to see conformal invariance if the lattice is drawn this way. So it might be, for instance, that horizontal and vertical direction are not equivalent, right? It should be some tilt. Um, if you think a bit more, you understand that it can't be reduced just to tilt this way. So you really should find a way to embed your fundamental domain into a plane. I don't know, like a parallelogram, and then do something like that. Okay, and you might wonder what would be a good embedding, etc. Uh, so, time permits, I <coughs> want to comment a bit on that. This is exactly the subject of the very last item. So, okay, for a while it was considered as an open question and now there is some hope. Okay, but to start with just, okay, some abstract graph. I don't even assume at the beginning that the interaction constants are critical. So, okay, just some combinatorial description. So this combinatorics part. Uh, what is the basic object in the Eisen model <coughs> is the order disorder correlators discussed by Dini. Uh, so in this particular case, what does it mean? So I'm going to work with such objects. So my spins they live on faces. My disorders are going to be are going to live on vertices. Like I have a product of say m disorders and spins. And I'm going to notate the correlation function like that. Uh, the very first remark is that it can be thought probabilistically. So yet again, what's that? Given say five, oh no five, sorry, four disorders like V1, V2, V3, maybe V4 here. I can fix disorder lines. They were originally blue in the knee talk, the knee talk, but Okay, then become orange, <laughs> something like that. So I fix these order lines, and then, uh, okay, I just, my spins, they live here. Like here there is U1, here there is U2. Um, okay, I can consider such, <coughs> such a correlation, where by this product, I can simply <coughs> mean, okay, I can write it, L let me do it like that. I can write this as an expectation of some random variable just to emphasize that there is a direct probabilistic meaning where this mu gamma is what? Gamma is a collection of all these parts. I can choose whatever I wish. And then this is exponential minus 2 beta, I hope, or plus 2 beta uh, j u u prime. So <coughs> it means that along, oh la la, it was a mistake at the very beginning, so there is no two. Yeah, so, sorry for that. Oh la 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 la, it was a mistake at the very top. Right, so it's now inconsistent. So in the first line, uh, the aligned spins, they contribute 
they must contribute exponential plus beta and the disaligned exponential minus beta. And it turns out to be either one or exponential minus two beta here. Okay, <coughs> and now uh, what I'm saying, what I'm saying with this, uh, with these disorders is that basically I flip the sign of the interaction constant along gammas. Okay, it should be minus. So it means basically that I replus, replace plus beta there by minus beta in the Hamiltonian. Okay, so this is a probabilistic object. <coughs> and uh, this story with, uh, with invariance under other topological moves of those strings, <coughs> as they, they described, uh, basically it says that this does not depend on gamma chosen until they do not cross spins, okay? So the gamma is just a the guy? The gamma is a, f is, yeah, is, a fixed, is a fixed path. Think about that. Between, Between these four points here. If there were five points? It must be even. Okay, or you go to infinity or to the boundary in my case. Uh, <coughs> okay. Uh, now, what I suggest is a more invariant description. Actually, uh, you can view it as follows. So. Uh, that's why I prefer this notation. So, <coughs> okay, we know that there is a probabilistic meaning, but now I want <coughs> uh, to think about that as a function of all the variables, of all the faces and vertices. And then you should be careful with signs, because remember there was a sign change when one of the lines cross the spins, jumps across the spin. So because of that, a priori, this is defined up to a sign, but then you can think what does it mean in terms of double covers. So what I <coughs> want to say is that this is a spinner on a double cover of what I take all faces of my graph, uh, all vertices, sorry, of my graph power m, uh, all faces of my graph power m. And then when I say spinner, uh, okay, by definition in my language, this is just a function which is defined on this double cover and which flips the sign between the two sheets of this double cover. Okay, and the rule is that <coughs> it has the same structure as uh, the product of all uh, u minus one half. Okay, like p one to n, m, q one to n, vp minus uq one half. This is just a function on the complex plane or in your domain, uh, which is defined up to a sign, but you can think of it <coughs> on a random surface. So each time one of these goes around one of u's, you change the sign. Okay. So this is the basic object. Then what you can do, starting from here, exactly as Dini did. So you define, when did I start, by the way, just to control time? It was 22, 33, 35, okay, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Two plus three is fine, right? Uh, so, <coughs> okay, now what you can do is to define uh, fermions, actually. So what are fermions? Okay, first I'm going to use the notation chi just to emphasize that those are real valued. I mean, yet again, <coughs> uh, okay, that, that's really a kind of a down to earth version of the previous talk. <coughs> so just review it like that. Um, okay, uh, what is what here? So first, what is C? Uh, C is what we are used to call a corner of our graph. So C actually lives here, okay? So you take on this picture, you take all the corners of all the faces of your graph. So this is just a notation uh, I'm going to use. So it means that each time I write a chi c, it means that I write both disorder and spin correlators. Okay. <coughs> With that, you should be careful because effectively there is this branching structure. So there is a choice of those four, four corners around the vertex. Okay, there is a branching structure <coughs> just to comment on that. If I want to consider a correlation function, so kind of remark, it's not going to be many theorems, maybe even no, <laughs> no theorem, so that's like in the previous talk, like remarks and proposition and properties. Okay, the remark is that, uh, okay, if I think about this, I'm going to introduce the notation along the way. 
So if you are lost with the notation, just cry and <coughs> okay, I'll come at. So what's that? I have one fermion, like mu, mu sigma, and then I have a number of disorders and spins sitting somewhere. So this omega is effectively a set of other vertices and faces. So other vertices and faces. Right, so I have such a correlation function. And then I should say, okay, where it lives. <coughs> okay, is a, sp is a spinner on something which I'm going to denote in an ugly manner. <coughs> okay, let me comment on that. So first, what is Y? Y is by definition the set of all corners. Okay, so the set of all corners All corners. And I'm going to be just combinatorial, just abstract enough. So it is a square grid which is drawn, but think of an abstract graph. Okay, this is a set of all corners of G. Then what this cross means. Okay, what <laughs> first what this cross means. This cross means that actually instead of having just this graph. Just this structure along every and around every edge, what you have is a double cover. It branches like that. So it branches around <coughs> an edge. Why? Because if you keep track of this v minus u one half, it makes the full turn when you go around. Okay? And equivalently, it branches around every vertex and around every face. So it is a double cover which is ugly. It branches everywhere. Okay? So this means branches everywhere. And this means, okay, if it was a spin, another spin inside here, then it kills the spin participating in chi, and the result is that, or say disorder at V, and the result is that the correlation does not branch around this point, except over, okay, omega, so technically this is bar sigma. Okay, yet again, in absence of spins and disorders, it branches everywhere because it, when you go around the vertex again, the square root adds you an additional sign. I still don't get what, what, what you mean by double cover. So it means that over each of the corners, there are two points. And then I ask how they are connected <coughs> with each other. It's like a combinatorial double cover. And to specify that, it's enough to specify either I have two, two closed contours, so I have a single contour here, there, and over all the faces and vertices. And what I am saying is that this cross means that I have I have branching everywhere. And this omega indicates that except at marked points. Is it better now? Okay, good. Thanks for asking because that's somehow an important definition. And, but how, how did your two sheets in your cover are glued together? This is, the <coughs> this is an abstract stuff, so that's like an abstract theorem. Uh, so th that's enough to specify the monodromy around every point, every face of the blue graph. Either this is plus one or minus one. So combinatorially, this is <coughs> it's an updater. So you, you simply take, <coughs> you simply control, I mean, on which sheet you leave when you, uh, when you propagate. That's it. Okay. So and now there is something important which I uh, want to, <coughs> uh, to write there, uh, just to keep later. So there is a linear equation of motion, a propagation equation for fermions. Uh, Etc. There are many, many names for that. So just <coughs> let me prefer to use the name propagation equation. <coughs> uh, so what's that? Imagine we have just a local portion of our graph, <laughs> effectively just a single edge. I need some notation, so what's going to be the notation? This is going to be, say, v0, v1. This is u0, u1. And also I have some corners nearby. Okay. So the corners are going to be notated 
like that. So the first index is the index of V, and the second index is the index of U. Okay? So, and remember, it, yeah, that's a slight mess, uh, because they leave not on the graph G, but on the double cover. Okay. So, <coughs> then what I pretend is the following. It was known, at least <coughs> back to 70s, but effectively that's, I believe, already in Anzager's work, so this I cannot claim. Uh <coughs> okay, then there is an identity. So if I consider a function, let me denote this function by x capital just to reflect that this is a correlation function with single chi. So if I and let me keep other points in the notation. So if I consider such a function, then <coughs> okay, it satisfies the following the following identity. Uh, if I evaluate it, say, here at C00, then it is a linear combination of these two values. Namely, again, I'm introducing some notation along the way. Be careful. So remember, I had this parameter x somewhere there. Originally, it was introduced in terms of the coupling constants, but I can also use whatever other parameterization I find convenient, right? So, and for this purpose, I <coughs> find convenient this parameterization. Okay, so x e is tangent one half theta e. And that's also why I wrote there pi over eight, pi over six. Okay, <coughs> you see. Eventually, it's, it's going to come into play with geometry. Okay, so there is this identity. What is the reason for that? Uh, I'm not going to prove it, of course, but that's very simple. So let, let me just indicate. So basically, <coughs> you say, okay, let me consider the product of two disorders sitting here and there. Then uh, I explained that this is a random variable, so to <coughs> evaluate it, I can fix whatever cut linking V0 and V1. I can do this cut. And then <coughs> there is a way to write it <coughs> in terms of spins. And in terms of spins, it's going to be x to the product of two spins. And x is exactly that. Then, okay, the product of two spins, that's the specific feature of the Eisen model. It has only two values. Uh, because of that, this is a linear combination of, okay, of constant and sigma sigma. And namely, this linear combination is equal to, I never remember, of course, one over sine theta, one minus sigma u, sigma u one cosine. So that's a trivial computation. Okay, I changed the parameterization, but at least it's clear that some linear equation must be there. And then <coughs> to get, so what I now have is a linear equation for the product of two disorders for the constant and sigma sigma. And what you do, you multiply it by, oh la la, by, by, uh, by sigma uh, u0, sigma v0. So you. That. So you now multiply it by sigma v0. And then, <coughs> okay, what you see eventually is that chi 0, 0 appears there. And okay, this, this equation must appear. And this is a reminder. Okay, <coughs> so a kind of very simple thing. Uh, but that's a very restrictive property of the Eisen model. Effectively, it means that if you know like the values of those function x along the line, then effectively you know all the values. Because once you know this and that, you immediately know that, and then you can propagate further along, along the edges. Okay, that's why propagation equation. Now, <coughs> okay, uh, the question how holomorphicity appears. 
uh, maybe I still, <coughs> I still write it here. So how to pass to holomorphicity? At this point, it must be some, okay. at least it could be, not must, but it could be a kind of inconvenience with this weird branching structure. So you might want to kill it, right? And to work with something, <coughs> with something easier. So the way to kill it, and let me, that's important, let me notate it somehow like star. Uh, <coughs> to kill it, you do the following. So you say, all right, let me introduce the following object. So to evaluate, it depends on, on the corner. It lives again on a double cover. And to evaluate it at the corner, you say, Effectively, I take the square root of v minus u back. So I prefer to have it unimodular. So that's effectively the square root one of a square root of v minus u, but that's a unimodular number. And for some reason, let me put here a constant factor. Uh, don't ask, don't tell. I mean, okay, just think it's one. <coughs> it works until some point very smoothly, and then this is just a change of the notation. Okay, this is something which again, branches here everywhere. So because of that, you what you can do, you can introduce a function f, which is by definition just a product. And it's nice because these branchings, they kill each other, right? Now when you go around, around uh, whatever, an edge or around the vertex, both factors branch, and because of that, the product is well defined. So now this is a spinner on in crack omega. Oh, la la. Hmm. Okay, let's, let's <coughs> leave it how it is. Uh, on uh, that, and what is that? This is now branches only over omega. Okay. I hope the notation is okay, not weird enough that that's a question how to develop it. Okay, <coughs> and now you can ask, uh, all right, now I have some observable. By the way, it's now complex valued. Now you can ask what are the linear relations for this observable. And then and the answer is pretty nice, provided there is a link between uh, weights and the geometry of your embedding. So right now, <coughs> okay. Assuming, uh, let me let me <coughs> write it here. So now assume that our graph, for instance, it was indeed the square lattice with the critical parameter. So I assume that, or hexagonal one, uh, that locally we have a rhombus. So that this is a rhombus. And it happened by a miracle that this angle is, a, is exactly the same theta. So that this theta is exactly the same. Then what you are seeing immediately <coughs> is that, okay, no, not immediately, but uh, you, you can work it out, uh, then this condition can be written as follows. So now I have a function which leaves here, etc. cetera. <coughs> uh, okay, and this can be rewritten as the discrete or holomorphistic condition. Okay, write it like that. Is it clear that you, you can always consider such an embedding? Not at all. No, 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 that's, that's a very good question. So it is not clear and this is totally wrong. I mean, so right now this is a very, very special case. So this is very, very special assumption, but at least on regular lattices, we are there. And what we see is that, okay, some discrete holomorphicity pops up. So what I want to emphasize is that <coughs> this way you see it not from combinatorics, but just from that propagation equation. So I didn't, didn't draw any contour expansion. So you can draw contour expansions of the correlation functions and, see, and deduce it from there, but effectively this is, okay, just a simple consequence of duality. This is more general than the isoidium. Wait, I mean, 
I still have 30 minutes. Uh, I should adjust, you know, the, the plan because, yeah, otherwise we would end up exactly in the same manner. I don't know, maybe <laughs> it's going to happen. That's the subject of the very last point in the discussion. Okay, so we have some discrete holomorphicity. Then what you can say is that, <coughs> all right, but here there is an information. So remember Hugo's lecture. So there is a hidden information. This f is not an abstract uh, complex number, right? Because this guy is real. Eta is something fixed. So effectively, this is a complex number with a prescribed complex phase. And in this equation, it is not, it is not remembered yet. But then, OK, this was, I don't know, like lemma. And then. OK, that, that's the first, <coughs> the first claim. And the second claim is that you can rewrite it. So there exists a number which I would denote fz. So what is z? z from now on is simply a quad. You might think about its center. If it was a rhombus, then this is its center. So <coughs> such that okay, fc reads Is effectively oh, oh, oh sorry sorry that, that's totally wrong. So this was this was real, uh, real and okay like that. So this quantity has a complex phase eta, right? If it was as I tried like eta bar plus eta, then it would be real. And right now this is parallel to to eta. Okay. So effectively, those, these four numbers, they can be viewed as projections of a single number fz. And moreover, uh, <coughs> there is a kind of a nice interpretation. So, so now I have a function which, is, which lives on quads fz. And you have a nice interpretation. <coughs> This says the following. Imagine I want to integrate that not along the, the whole boundary of the rhombus, but just <coughs> to compute two increments here and there. Okay? So I compute C zero Q uh, UQ minus V zero plus F one Q V1 minus UQ. They are the same uh, for both choices of Q because I can integrate along any contour. I can move the contour. And if I multiply it by 2, then, uh, okay, uh, what I see, this is a computation, is Fz V1 minus V0. <coughs> Just an exercise. So, what does it mean? It means that effectively, instead of considering integrals of Fc along the boundaries of Rambai, I could also consider the contour integrals of my Fz like that. They all also vanish, and uh, the same holds if I would replace uh, vertices by faces because somehow that's a, okay. That's a dual picture. So similarly for you, and similarly for you. Okay, and similarly. For Fz, you want minus u zero, okay? And this gives you a tool because now, okay, you have a function uh, with, uh, okay, all the possible contour integrals vanishing, <coughs> and then you might hope to identify the limit of these functions when the mesh becomes small. So now, <coughs> just to indicate what is the setup in for convergence theorems. So what you now can do is the following. So what is the goal of, I mean, one of the possible goals in this activity? So the goal is uh, okay, convergence theorems. Okay, uh, first it must be some parameter. The parameter is the lattice step. It must be some setup which is going to be what we call scaling limit. This means we have an approximation to a given domain. So 
exactly by square grids and the uh, critical Isaac model there. And what we want to know is the following statement. That the expectation of the product of some variables, okay, what are the variables until now? Those are spins, disorders, those fermions. Okay, let me maybe instead of expectations, I just put this notation like I have psi, psi bar, mu sigma. So, okay, what are what is psi? Psi is a linear combination which corresponds to the function f. So this is going to be psi z observable. This is going to be psi z bar observable. Okay? So in discrete, all these quantities, they can be viewed probabilistically. So if you're, <coughs> okay, you might think just about single spins or just, I don't know, some mixture of spins and disorders. And you want to prove that being normalized properly to some exponent, these correlation functions, they do converge to to <coughs> uh, some other uh, some functions, so those are just functions in omega. Uh, which satisfy some, okay, nice properties. And <coughs> what basically is this list of properties? Uh, yeah, I'm not going to write them all down, <coughs> but just to indicate. So for instance, each time you see this one, it must be holomorphic in Z. And this is a reminiscent of the fact that F is holomorphic. This one must be anti-holomorphic. Then, <laughs> effectively, you want fusion rules. So you want to specify what happens when two points inside of these correlation functions approach each, each other. Okay, a number of fusion rules. Effectively, you want that mu and sigma being collapsed, they give you a fermion back. So. I'm just, you know, a bit hand waving. <coughs> uh, here, don't ask too, much, too many questions, please. So what's that? This is omega psi plus eta psi plus eta <coughs> psi bar. Then you want that when you collapse the fermion onto a spin, the disorder appears because that's what happens in discrete, right? If I consider a spin multiplied, spin here multiplied by the fermion here, Okay, if spins cancel out, only, only <coughs> disorder survives. So that's like mu with some complex factor, which I don't remember, uh, and so on and so forth. Some frequency. And so on and so forth. So, <coughs> okay, you open the textbook in conformal field theory. This is the basic example. And then you learn what is the axiomatic these functions must satisfy. Uh, what is their main property of those is that they are all conformally covariant. So, okay, they satisfy conformal covariance property. <coughs> Which means that when you change the domain, all these functions, they <coughs> transform nicely. They are multiplied by some powers of derivative of the conformal map. So if you apply a conformal map to here, so if you start with, <coughs> with omega and map it to some omega prime, then effectively <coughs> when you have, uh, when you have like, some field sitting in Z1, etc., some other field sitting in Zn. <coughs> uh, 
uh, compute this in omega. This is the same as you would compute in the new domain. in omega prime up to a product of, of the derivatives at zk to some power okay, and derivatives bar to some other power. <coughs> so this is one of the possible goals just to say that the picture we have in discrete. So somehow what is on the left you can view it as in particular case of the construction we go described uh, in the morning in discrete, so it defines these objects in discrete. This is a picture <coughs> you can learn from theoretical physics that it must be a set of correlation functions. And what you want to do as a mathematician, <coughs> you want to prove that, okay, in fact, discrete objects, they approximate continuous ones. Okay, so right now this is a theorem. In the generality written here, and moreover, you can also add energies, etc. So th that's really fixed. You can play with boundary conditions. Instead of plus ones, you can take a combination of plus and three. You can do it in multiply connected domain. Uh, we stopped short before considering Riemann surfaces, but there, okay, you you additionally sum over all spin structures, and this is <coughs> I should say that this uh, result due to Clément Angler, Konstantin uh, Izurev, and myself. <laughs> of course, this is a very sketchy description because I didn't say what are deltas, right? And there were even two instances of deltas. It was delta scaling exponent there, and then <coughs> delta plus, delta minus scaling exponents there. Okay, just to maybe to complete this picture a bit, uh, what are the exponents? So for the spin and disorders, this is 116, 116. And for the fermion, for the psi, this is one half, one half zero. For psi bar, this is zero, one half. Um, okay, and at that point, here yeah, I'm not going to really explain how to prove this theorem, uh, but the message <laughs> you might take home is that, okay, somehow this description is completed. So you really see the correspondence. Maybe it's worth to comment <coughs> on a single point. So I said that there is a main tool. The main tool are those functions f. Okay, you see some discrete holomorphicity, and then according to the program written, at the top, so you should consider some boundary value problems for them. Okay, so the <coughs> the idea is to so the main idea is to exploit boundary value problems uh, for these observables. Homomorphic observables. <coughs> I don't have to comment on how working with fermions you get spins at the end. This is an interesting question, but yeah, probably I don't have time <coughs> for that. Uh, instead, I want to just to because there are questions about these S embeddings and people. You know, an orga the organizer wants to learn something new. Uh, so I want to comment <coughs> on a tool which was considered technical, but in fact, now I believe it's not. So there is some construction which is due to Smirnov. So in a sense, what I explained till this point, I mean, the construction of these functions, well, it was there for years. Okay, it was more a question how to use it. And then it was a tool, just the combinatorial stuff, okay, just a tool, introduced by Stas. Uh, which is the following observation. Just imagine I start with whatever solution to this equation. Then you can do the following. So you can define the function on both vertices and faces, 
traditionally it's called h. Okay, this is either hx or I'm going to notate or hf. Okay, think of some function which satisfies this, this relation. Basically, this is a correlation function. And then you do the following. So you say that given a vertex and a face, so given a picture like that, so this is v, this is u, this is c. You simply say that h v minus h u is what? In that setup, it's going to be real valued, and it's going to be x squared. So here is a definition. OK, this is an exercise to check that it is well defined. But this is not a consequence of the rhombus stuff. It is well defined just because of this definition. So what is important? I want to emphasize that it is an abstract relation. So to define such a function, I do not need to fix whatever embeds in. So what I need is, well, I just consider this as a map, this fixed up to homotopy. Okay. Okay, and moreover, uh, there is an analog of this statement. So moreover, okay, you can say that <coughs> uh, if, okay, moreover, well, let me put it like here. Moreover, <coughs> in the rhombic case, so this is abstract. But in the rhombic case, you can also say that uh, hv1 minus hv0, maybe with the coefficient 2 again, is imaginary part of fz squared v1 minus v0. So this function h, it has some interpretation in terms of the function f. Okay, that's the moral of the story. So, okay. Now, how the proof goes just in, in two minutes. Okay, you have a function which is holomorphic inside except at singularities. Um, okay, assume you know it is regular enough. This is a kind of a tricky point because time to time you do not have any probabilistic argument like Rosa-Samer-Welsh theory for that. So you did use it from ju just purely from complex analysis. But assuming it is regular enough by my error theorem, as Hugo explained, <coughs> it must have some limit, uh, properly rescaled maybe. And then the question is what are, boundary, what are the boundary conditions? And for the boundary conditions, okay, maybe in this color. So let me put it here. So what are boundary conditions? For the function h, those are just Dirichlet ones. Okay. By the way, if you, I mean, if you combine this and that, you see that boundary conditions for f, are, for the function f, are really ugly to work. So okay, h apparently happens to be a good object. So yet again, a priori, when you define it like that. It doesn't to be very much linked with spin with, with Ising model correlations. It seems to be just a technical tool, but at least what is <coughs> one good role is that it encodes boundary conditions in a in a nice manner. And then, uh, okay, you do some analysis here. I don't <coughs> I don't want to comment on that uh, today. Uh, here, after all, this theorem is. At least for spin correlations, this is five years old and even more. So <coughs> it's already well discussed. Okay. So, but <coughs> yeah, right now here is a setup. And what I want to do now is to jump to the last point. Just I'm not going to explain how to pass from fermions to spins and just go to the last point and to discuss a bit universality. So what is on the blackboard? On the blackboard, if you trust me that this program can be performed, can be realized, then 
there is a kind of a universal statement because it looks like everything works at least simultaneously on the square grid and on the hexagonal one, right? Because what I only need is this condition, which is purely geometrical, okay? By the way, so if it was a square grid, then theta is pi over four, and then this x is exactly tangent pi over eight, so it fits. If it was hexagonal grid, then this theta is pi over, I don't know, three, and that is <laughs> pi over six, so it fits. Also, if you know what either radial graphs are, then, okay, this is a z-invariant model on, on an either radial graph, critical one, and uh, the proofs work more or less smoothly, though just for the record, I should say that for spin correlations, still, okay, some ingredient is not written down. And I cannot claim I really know how to fix it. <coughs> but at least for fermions, it works well. For curves, the for it works well. So, okay, this universe. But then there's a question, okay, Nicola already asked, and the question I already mentioned at the very beginning. Okay, is it clear that given a graph, I can embed it in such a nice manner? Okay, so. If you are lost, you, you might try to wake up because I'm going to, to come back to, to the beginning of the story. So somehow. <laughs> okay, you count parameters and you see that there is no hope. Not at all. And somehow you are disappointed because even in this doubly periodic case, okay, there is something puzzling. I mean, it should be possible to treat it, but okay, you don't have a, such a tool. The problem is that this lemma seems to be very much dependent on the geometry. So now I'm going to comment on the way I hope all that can be relaxed. So this as embedded stuff. And as a model example, think about doubly periodic case, for instance. Okay, what are S embeddings? One of the uh, statements in uh, this criticality condition, which I mentioned due to Hugo and David Simazzoni, is the following. So <coughs> in the doubly periodic, so kind of a motivation. In the doubly periodic setup, There are two uh, functions, two linear independent functions, x1, x2, uh, which are periodic and satisfying this propagation equation. Uh, this is not how it's written in their paper, but it's equivalent way of saying. So you just think about this propagation equation uh, you want to find the periodic solution, and then it happens that the kernel is non-trivial. Effectively, this is exactly the criticality condition. So in their paper, this is a kernel of the Cutsworth matrix, but they're equivalent. That, that's the same. Okay? Now there is the following idea, which I believe to be new, more or less. Uh, partially, okay, some particular case was also uh, discovered by Martin Lees independently in December. Okay, now you can do the following. <coughs> you say, okay, I have such a function, and it's still written, I hope, on the top, that there is a way to define this function h just out of, of this condition. Okay? That's algebra. So in particular, it would work even x was complex. Why not? Okay, you say, now given, okay, given a graph, a weighted graph, graph Gx, <coughs> and the pair x1, x2 of spinners, of real valued spinners, satisfying this condition. Those are abstract ones. They, they are not necessarily correlations of so satisfying 
register. Uh, you can try just to construct an embedding of your graph by using this function h. This seems to be a bit ridiculous first. Okay, just define s to be h x1 plus Okay, <coughs> a bit weird. Uh, and assume that the combinatorics of this embedding, that there are no overlaps, etc. So I'm not going to discuss under which conditions this holds, and I don't have a definitive answer, but at least in some vicinity of isoradial embeddings, this holds. Um, okay, so it's going to be, it's going to assign Uh, some value to whatever phase, uh, to whatever vertex and phase. So it's going to be a picture like that. And then you might wonder, so the idea is that you want to generalize isoradial embeddings. So in the isoradial embeddings, all the squads, they are by. Okay, then you ask, but what is the properties of the squad? Effectively, this should be a matter of computation, right? Because you have functions parameterized by, by two unknowns. And the answer is the following. So all these quads uh, happen to be tangential quads. So there are circles inscribed into them. Okay. Then, j just trust me, so claim, claim all quads are tangential. And moreover, if you want to recover the weight, this xe, from the geometry, there is a formula. So there is something explicit. Okay, in terms of geometry. So there is a thing I want to insist on. And uh, the thing is that this correspondence is one to one. So, other way around. If I draw you a tiling of a plane by the squads, then it defines me a graph, of course, because I just, okay, up to a homotopy, a collection of weights, because I said that, okay, there is an explicit formula, and moreover, it defines me x, x <coughs> plus i x2, uh, because they are simply square roots of those of those directions and they have correct branching structure. So this is really one-to-one -one and somehow the ultimate goal of that is to use it to study Eisen model on whatever, on more complicated graphs, so ultimately on random maps. Okay, I have no, no clue how to do that, but you can say, okay, I have a random map I equipped with the Eisen model. And then I want to, to, <coughs> to figure out what is the proper embedding. So this is a kind of a candidate. Now, of course, the question is to which extent the relations above, they hold, right? And uh, the answer... You said that not all graphs admit such an embedding, right? No, I said that all admits. All, uh, a priori, okay, th that's a question what you ask about x1 and x2. So ideally, you want them to be bounded, right? So that your tiling has, so remember, x is a square of the, of the length, so that your tiling is okay. This should appear only at criticality. So now it's a bit discussion part already. Uh, so a priori, you, you, you cannot expect this, this outside of criticality. But on combinatorial level, okay, it works. So now, of course, the, the question is <coughs> to which extent what is written on the left and on the right can be generalized. So and now let me tell you about this generalization to conclude. So first, okay, let me add here an additional normalization. So what is delta C? Uh, so here is a vertex and a face. And by this delta C, I just define the, the length of this segment. Okay. In the Rombi case, it was everywhere the same. Now it depends. Okay, now I'm going to correct just that, equ that <coughs> equation. To say what is true and what is not. Oh, 
error for that. Okay, so this is a correction. Maybe uh, what is a good co color? Okay, yellow is okay. Blue here is a good color. So this still holds true. So whatever graph you start with, provided you embed it in such a way, apparently you see discrete holomorphicity appearing, at least in some form. So that's okay, not very expected because mm, okay, at this point it's it's even a bit fishy because um, okay, maybe there are several ways to embed the same graph. And they are not all the conformally equivalent, equivalent. For instance, you can put here instead of i two i, it would be different embedding. Okay, how to how to figure out what's happening? Then there is a correction to what to to this equation. So remember, I told you that the contour integrals of f of z are effectively the same as contour integrals around from by. So in this case, this is not, not exactly the case. Uh, there is an additional term. Okay, <laughs> so what is this function L? So now it is not a rhombus anymore. And the function L effectively, it, it measures the distance. So LV minus LU is by definition simply distance V minus U. Okay, in the rhombus case, this disappears. In the rhombi case, this disappears, it's simply zero. And here a correction, I mean, you, you see correction. And now you might wonder, all right, but maybe this FZ is a better. So by, by the way, this still holds. I mean, this both still hold. So still there is a number which is projected onto this FC. And then you might say, but okay, what about contour integrals of that? And uh, the last piece of information I want to discuss is the following. So just think about that. Let me draw a contour, say on vertices of my graph, something like that. And let me try to integrate fz dz along this contour. This is a closed form. So effectively, this is the same as the contour integral fz bar l minus l, right? And I can do integration by parts. So I can always write it like fz1 minus fz2 bar multiplied by l. Yeah, this is an identity. So what I need is that this these integrals, they approximately vanish. What about function L? Maybe you expect that you can do, you can make it really small. So yet again, what L counts? It just counts, okay, when you go from white to black, then it adds the length of the edge. So imagine, okay, wishful thinking. But this is a statement, a fair statement, say, in the doubly periodic case, that you can choose x1 and x2 such that this function is of order delta. Okay, you have a hundred types of tiles. So what you need is that, in the doubly periodic case, what you need is that when you compute the increment of L along this and along that, they both vanish. So what you want is that L periodic. For instance, in the doubly periodic case, if this is periodic, then this is of order delta. Okay, but then <coughs> what you immediately see is that you need a rather mild condition on F. So what you need is that this function F effectively, okay, it's equicontinuous. Equicontinuity here is enough. So once you know this, tends to zero, you know that all the contour integrals, they vanish, and okay, you, you, can, you can play your game. So here is the point that, okay, there is such a structure. Uh, there are no theorems yet, but somehow it looks rather promising. <coughs> uh, 
Yeah. And just to comment, a very particular case you can think about is the case uh, discovered by Marcin Lees independently, as I mentioned, when all the guys are deltoids. So what are deltoids? When all of them, okay, this is equal to that. So it means that you have a circle pattern uh, like that with different circles. So in this case, uh, on one of the type of vertices, the function L is simply constant. So on the black vertices here, L is constant. So because of that, you have half homomorphicity for free. Uh, but that's somehow a particular case of the general stuff. So now the current state of the art basically is that, okay, it seems now to be a question of discrete complex analysis just to prove that F is, F is regular enough. And then it would open a way it would pave the way to uh, to really universe universality convergence theorems. Okay, yeah, I believe it's time to stop. Sorry for the for the delay. Other questions? My question then. So. Before that, for uh, iso radial graphs, we needed a, a control on the type on the on the angle, right? You yeah. So we needed the control that the angles are not too acute, that the angles are bounded below. And there, you believe that that you can release uh, the constraint to to as you said. No, well, that, that that that's a very good question. So, Nicola, I don't know at this point. So somehow, you know, it was uh, it was really open for years. I mean, how to handle how to handle something more general than uh, is a radial stuff. So, okay, so what Marchin proved, for instance, is that once you start, okay, it's written in less generality, but the proof works in this generality. If you start with whatever tiling such that the sizes are bounded, the sizes of tiles are bounded uh, time to time from one side, but let us think from both sides, then the model is critical in the sense of, um, spin-spin correlations and the single point magnetization. It's a good question to study now how much one can relax the assumption on boundedness. Do you believe that, for example, if you take two nearby uh, ties, if they are comparable, this would... No, comparable is too weak, right? Because you still can have exponential growth. No, 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 no. What, what you at least, I mean, intuitively, what you should have is that the size of a tile, a distance, whatever R is or small of R at least, Otherwise, this, this doesn't look. Uh, so, um, okay, for me, that's more like, you know, a set of questions now, because there is a tool. So for those who know about this sub super harmonicity of the function H, there is an analog of that in this setup. So there are kind of replacements of Laplacian operators, okay, which say that the function H is a kind of S harmonic, I call it S sub harmonic on this lattice. So um, I don't know, yeah. Uh, thanks for asking. Again, in, indeed, there is at least one result already. So mm, I uploaded a paper in the beginning of December and like in 10 days, uh, a result by Marcin appeared independently. <laughs> so, um, so what I believe is, is that it might be a good, a good way to embed graphs. Okay, that, that's the only point. No theorems, sorry. <laughs> Apart from that, but that's all. <laughs>